aren't always so good. And again, the positive emotions and thinking less of, I mean, not less of yourself, but of yourself less, is future oriented. It's hard to have hope or forgiveness or gratitude or love. One, it's always about the other. And two, it's future oriented where lust and gluttony and uh, aggression is, is all about the self. Okay. What struck us first about Susan Welcome is she was a 78-year-old overweight woman in a dress that looked kind of like a flower sack. And after two hours with her, she was the grandmother I'd always wanted, and her dress hung on her like a Hawaiian queen's mumu. And this is because her defensive style was magically uh, empathic. Uh, a lot of the Terman women in their uh, late 70s and early 80s lived in gated communities with double locks on the door. Susan Welcome lived on an Akron, which is a working class industrial neighborhood with nothing between her and the outside world but an unlocked screen door. So when we came, she welcomed these two strangers um, in, but was still talking on the telephone and managed to be attentive both to her new guest and the person she was talking to at the same time. Time. And this was really a metaphor for her openness to life. Uh, we hadn't sat down but a couple of minutes before the telephone rang. No, she couldn't uh, come to dinner. She was looking after the um, youth orchestra. She'd already been to the polls, and that seemed to me like a big deal when you were very old. But let me assure you, <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, she couldn't help revealing, though, that she had one of the meanest mothers in the entire study. Her mother was a fundamentalist who set her daughter to work on the uh, Los Angeles vaudeville scale, uh, stage, dancing and singing. And the problems that uh, Susan felt, faced was that she knew dancing was a sin. And because she was only five years old, she had to lie and say she was six to get around the uh, California employment laws. And at the same time, she knew it was a sin to hate your mother. So how do you get out of a jam like that? Well, Susan didn't have a determine IQ for nothing. And the only way she could defeat her mother, who knew that her daughter was not only a uh, good at vaudeville and making money for the mother, but was a determined uh, child, uh, her mother, as Susan said, wanted to be, to be great. So my solution was to fail at everything. Call it spitting to windward. Call it passive aggression. And the problem is, when you torture other people by failing yourself, I mean, it's sadomasochism wrapped into one. At school, the children used to tease her unmercifully. And because she belonged to something called the Christian Church, and most of the students in her school were Catholic, they used to tease her about that. And her mother, being as adept at unempathic defenses as her daughter, said, that's fine. Just hate Catholics. So that's what she grew up in, secretly hating her mother and being taught to hate anybody 
different from her self. Susan's mother um, neither enjoyed cooking, nor did she sew, and she kept her daughter from learning these things. And she used to call children little stinks. And as an only child, Susan said the meanest thing her mother ever did to her was to say that she wished she'd never had her. So in terms of learning basic trust, autonomy, and initiative, it seemed as if Susan would be absolutely behind the um, blackboard. Asked what she would do differently if she had her life to live over, Susan said, I'd have brothers and sisters and a new mother. <laughs> uh, when she went to Berkeley, she thought that nurses were just glorified slaves of doctors, highly qualified glorified slaves of doctors. But she gave up getting a degree and went into nursing school, which was, to her view, apologies to those of you who are very happy RNs, was the most self-destructive thing she could think of. Uh, in high school, the uh, Terman interviewer remarked on how clumsy Susan was. and said that she couldn't imagine her ever having been on the stage um, dancing. Her mother realized that she had a photographic memory for music and could play the piano beautifully. Susan wanted to play Bach. Her mother thought it was much nicer if Susan played her pretty music, like Strauss waltzes. So Susan retaliated by giving up the piano altogether. All right. Most of the women in the Terman study did not have mentors. As I said, their mothers got the vote when they, she, they were 10 years old, and their career development was absolutely horrible. These gifted women whose IQs were higher than most of the women in this room, uh, out of 600, probably 590, had careers that you would sniff at to support their families during the Great Depression. They were the only ones that could get a job as executive secretaries. Okay. Um, I've, I've told you about her rebellion, but she, being open to the world, being gifted with being able to save her and take things in as Dr. Mann was not. Um, and you don't get it from a loving mother because Susan certainly didn't have one. And this, of course, is the exciting thing about studying lives until 90. There's continuous surprises. For example, the uh, a man who had been divorced four times and seemed like the original immature no-hoper no at 48 got remarried, has been married happily for 42 years, and at 86 takes only one medicine. Most people at 75 take five. He takes only one medicine, and what do you think that medicine is? No pulling the wool over your eyes. <laughs> anyway, she found a mentor who was a, went to her church so she could take the mentor inside, but who taught her to sew, who taught her to cook, who taught her to learn romance languages and supported her in all the things that her non-generative mother would always say, you might get hurt. OK. Five years later, the mentor died. And the 
mother in her meanness doesn't let Susan go to the funeral. How did you feel? I felt terribly sad. Unlike Dr. Mann, who when he was uh, depressed under potential suicide could only feel fatigue. But how did Susan deal with the loss? First thing was she fell in love with music again. Only this time she played the violin, which she could play in church and at her father's lodge rather than entertaining her mother. She also quit nursing and threw herself into music across the... Um, board embracing what was her natural talent. She was still a housewife, mind you. But during the interview, Susan jumped up and went to a picture of her French teacher, which was not turned towards the wall, was not hidden in a lovely Thai silk thong, and said, I always think pictures make things clearer. And the whole room was filled with treasures from her experience with the French teacher. A uh, piano had been, her old piano was moved back into the house. In the center of the room was a sewing table. On the coffee table were Quilter's magazine. And a major part of old age is managing to hold on to lost love. The mammalian brain doesn't forget the people that it loved and is strengthened by them. When she was 27, Susan had three enormous changes in her life that helped move her from narcissistic defenses to empathic defenses. First, she had a thyroidectomy, and when the goiter was removed, she said she'd experienced an epiphany. It seemed as if an inhibition to rage toward my mother seemed to have been removed. And for the first time, I could talk to my mother without feeling I was suffocating. So here we have the id pulling anger up into your head and feeling it being a sign of health. She could acknowledge and pull up into her head that she'd had a terribly unhappy childhood. Okay, how did she deal with that in the real world? She became a, this woman who previously had suffocated and been unable to contain her rage, developed an avocation of helping women in prison. In other words, she managed to transform spiteful martyrdom into the gold of loving service and altruism. I mean, that's magical. You can't do it on purpose. But it's the wonderful thing about limbic maturity. Second thing is she wrote to Lewis Terman when she was 29, having gotten married at, uh, shortly after the uh, music teacher died. I always put my husband and baby first in everything. In other words, she knew what her mother didn't, that biology flows downhill. You don't have to listen to Moses and Confucius. It's all right to be angry at your parent. Biology flows downhill. It's their job to hold your anger, just as is your parents' job to hold their children's anger and their joy and their savoring of love letters. Uh, her husband had died two years ago, and she said, when I think of him,